just starting with some introductions then, for those of you who don't know, I'm Elaine McElroy, one of the partners in the employment and immigration team at Brodie's. And with me today is Erin McLafferty, one of the associates in the team. And the title of the session today is Immigration Update for HR. We're going to cover the high potential visa, the new global business mobility route, and also digital right to work checks. So uh, we'll run through, first of all, digital right to work checks, which came in on the 6th of April 2022, the global business mobility route, which already opened on the 11th of April, the new high potential visa, which will come in on the 30th of May 2022, and finally, recruiting those on scale up visas, which will be uh, coming in on the 22nd of August this year. But just starting with a little bit of background to the changes. So the rules on immigration don't stand still for long. We're always kept on our toes with, with new changes coming in. And in 2021, we had, of course, the new points-based immigration system and significant reforms to the skilled worker route and we had to get to grips with all of that. There was also the end of the Brexit uh, grace period with changes to right to work checks on several occasions throughout that. There were also in place adjusted uh, COVID right to work checks, which are going to come to an end finally in September, 2022. There's been various dates announced for when those would end and they've always been sort of extended, but the final, final uh, sort of end date for those is going to be September this year. And Erin's going to talk in her session about the new move to a digitized system of right to work checks, which will be um, helpful for employers once those COVID remote checks go, because a lot of employers have welcomed the fact that it's uh, been possible to do right to work checks without uh, having the document in your possession. Um, in the summer of 2021, the UK government also announced as part of its innovation strategy details of three new visa categories, um, all of which are designed to attract highly skilled individuals uh, to the UK and to boost innovation. One of those routes, as I mentioned, is already live and we'll touch on that and its relevance for HR and for employers. And there are two other routes yet to come, so we'll have a chance to sort of touch on all of those. But for now, I'll just hand over to Erin to start off on right to work checks. Great, thanks Elaine. So as Elaine touched on, um, there have been some recent changes to right to work checks um, and we're going to go through those um, or, or most of those today on the session in a bit more detail. But one of the key things um, to be aware of is that there are now three different ways to carry out a right to work check for someone who's beginning employment with you in the UK. First of all, there is the Home Office Online Right to Work Check service. Um, some of you may be familiar with this um, and may have used it in the past, but we'll chat about that in a bit more detail because it's likely to be something that you become more familiar with um, over the next uh, wee while. There's also then the manual right to work checks, which are your kind of old fashioned getting a hard copy document, taking a scan of it and um, checking someone's identity in person. And there will also be the third um, new way of doing right to work checks, which is through the digital um, identity check, and that's through third party uh, identity service providers. And we'll chat about that in a bit more detail in the session today because that's brand new and was only introduced on the 6th of April this year. So from that same date, um, one of the key other changes to be aware of is that you can no longer accept um, hard copy documents for biometric residence permits, biometric residence cards or frontier worker permits. Um, if you do accept them in hard copy, you will no longer obtain a statutory excuse for that individual, which means that if it transpires that they do not have the right to work for you in the UK, you may be um, liable for a civil penalty or fine. Um, to obtain that statutory excuse, it is important to know that you must conduct the check using the online right to work service um, check, and I'm going to show you how that will look in the next few slides. Um, but these were previously optional and they are now mandatory, so that is a change and it is something to be aware of. Another change um, that Elaine touched on in her introduction is that the temporary COVID adjusted checks are finally coming to an end. Um, you may be aware that there has been numerous different deadlines, but it does seem that they are finally coming to an end in September this year. Um, lots of employers have utilised these um, adjusted checks and they have been pretty well received. They did allow you to do the check remotely and it meant that you as the employer did not have to obtain that hard copy document. Um, that is coming to an end. There are things for you as an employer to be thinking about. 
as um, those changes come to an end and we are in this kind of um, phasing out period. And the reason the government have given that extra extension is to allow employers an opportunity to think about what are they going to do next for right to work checks. So, um, as I said, I would just quickly uh, show you the online right to work check service if you're unfamiliar with it. It is um, how you would conduct a check for someone who has status under the EU settlement scheme. So some of you may have seen this before, but as I said, it is now compulsory for those with um, biometric residence uh, cards or permits. So it might be something you use more frequently in the future. To access it, you'll go on to the view a uh, job applicants right to work details page on the doc gov.uk website it will look something like on the slide there to be able to use it you'll need to obtain the share code eh, and date of birth of your candidate so on the next slide um, we have a kind of screenshot of the type of information that will be sent to you so the candidate themselves has to go and um, generate this share code and date of birth email it's usually sent to you securely and it provides you with the information that you need to conduct that check You'll input the share code and date of birth on that previous screen uh, that was on the last slide. And then um, on the next slide, we'll see um, the type of uh, information that will be generated by doing that check. So you'll see that you have um, a picture of the individual, you have um, the dates during which they are permitted to work in the United Kingdom. And if there are any conditions relating to their leave, it will be in that details section there. So that is how it will look, that you will save that PDF down and that will, for all intents and purposes, be your right to work check. So it is straightforward and easy and very accessible, um, but definitely something to familiarise yourself with if you haven't been through the process before. Um, but as mentioned, the kind of key change that came into place in the 6th of April was the introduction of the digital right to work check process. And from that date, it is possible to do right to work checks um, through this route. Mm -hmm. They are available for British and Irish mm -hmm. citizens who've got valid passports or Irish passport cards only. Um, but it is important to remember that those uh, passports or passport cards will have to be valid. If the individual has an expired passport, they will have to be done um, manually. So do keep that in mind. To do these checks, you will ask um, an approved digital identity service provider to do the check on your behalf. The UK government will release um, a list of accredited providers um, on the Home Office website. At the moment, we are aware lots of third party providers are currently going through that approval process. So it may be possible for you as an employer to reach out to certain providers um, to get an idea of the system that they're going to introduce and the costs that they may um, charge in relation to that. But the key thing to remember is that you as the employer are still ultimately responsible for any civil penalty that may be um, liable. So it's important to remember that you cannot outsource the entire process. Um, but do bear in mind that you will only receive a civil penalty if one, the employee turns out to be working without permission, and two, it's reasonably apparent that the check was not carried out correctly. Um, you as the employer must have a reasonable belief that your third party identity service provider did carry out the check in line with the guidance. That means that you as the employer should still carry out diligence. You should still uh, train your staff to make sure they know what to look for when they get that check back from the third party. Um, and do make sure that you're checking um, photos and dates of birth to ensure that information is consistent. In terms of process, um, your recruits will send uh, images of their passport or passport card, as it may be, to the third party service providers. They will then undertake the checks using technology and verify certain information that, that allows them to provide um, a summary confirming the individual's uh, right to work in the UK. They will charge a fee for that, um, and you may want to contact third parties uh, going through the approval process to see the types of fees that they will specifically uh, charge. You as the employer should still check that the summary um, is consistent with the individual who's presenting themselves for work, so do make sure that their photos and dates of birth are consistent, and do keep um, a copy of that check uh, in line with the guidance, which is usually for the duration of the employment and for two years after termination. Um, key takeaways on the digital service then and things to kind of remember, I guess a big advantage is that it will allow you to continue carrying out right to work checks remotely. Um, that is a big advantage and something we've all become very accustomed to over the last two years with the COVID adjusted, adjust, adjusted checks. Um, 
But as those are phased out, it is important to think about whether using the digital service um, will be something that is uh, beneficial to your organisation. It also means that you're likely to have a better and more secure record of the right to work check. It means that you're not taking photocopies of documents and writing um, information on that photocopy. It does mean that you will have a kind of digital check somewhere to store and keep. Um, the main downside, though, as you may have seen as I've spoken about this, is there is a cost attributable, so you will pay that to the third party. Um, I guess employers are very used to right to work checks being free in terms of uh, monetary cost, albeit they did take some time and effort from staff, but the third parties will be charging a fee, so that's something to think about when you're considering using this service. So, um, key things to take away then on the recent right to work uh, check changes is first of all, don't confuse the online right to work service with the digital identity check service. Um, they do sound similar, but they are different. It's important to know the difference and when you can use each and when to use each, and, and in some cases it may be mandatory. Um, have a think about whether your organisation will use third party providers um, for doing digital right to work checks. And that will need to be a kind of way up with costs, um, as well as the amount of staff that you recruit, um, and how frequently you do right to work checks and how much that will then cost per head to do the checks with a third party provider. Also have a think about your organisation. Do you have lots of remote workers? Is it feasible for them to come into an office and do a manual check or actually is a digital identity service provider a great um, kind of way to get around that if you've got remote workers? So some things to think about there. Um, key thing is also remember that your COVID-19 adjusted checks will end in September this year. So it is important to have that kind of um, internal discussion or, or kind of consideration about digital service uh, providers before the end of that transition period in September. If you do want to go back to doing manual checks, have a think about your process for that. That will involve uh, you as the employer obtaining the hard copy documents. Would that involve the individual coming in to do the check in person? Or would it involve them um, being sent securely by courier, for example? So lots of things to think about in terms of process. And once you've had those internal considerations and come up with a, a plan, um, make sure you revise your right to work processes and policies. Make sure you train your staff. Uh, make sure they know what to look for in relation to checks, especially from October time when things are starting to change. Um, and do, if in doubt, pull out the new right to work guidance. Um, it was issued on the 6th of April and it does have lots of comprehensive guidance and things to think about in relation to, to everything that we've discussed today. Also remember that if you are a licensed sponsor um, to sponsor skilled workers in the UK, right to work checks are doubly important um, and failure to have robust policies um, can result in uh, your license being um, in extreme cases revoked. So I guess an additional layer to think about there. So that's a kind of overview then of the recent changes. I'm going to hand over to Elaine and she's going to talk about some of the visa changes coming in place this year. Thanks, Erin. Um, yep, yeah, as Erin said, I'm going to touch on the new visa route, starting with the Global Business Mobility route. And that route opened on the 11th of April 2022, so we've already got it in force. And if you're interested in knowing more about it, there is new up-to-date policy guidance available on UKVI's website, which deals with the Global Business Mobility route. They've updated all of that. And this is really a sort of umbrella category for a number of different visa categories that sit under it. Um, so, and what it does is consolidate some existing visa categories that we already had with a couple of tweaks. And it also introduces certain new categories. So there's five um, subcategories that sit under the global business mobility route. Instead of ICT, intracompany transfers, which um, closed at nine o'clock on the 11th of April, we've now got the senior or specialist worker category, and a lot of you will be familiar with the language of ICT that's been around for a long time. So that's now gone. It's been rebranded as senior or specialist worker category, but there's not that much else that's different about it. In my next slide, I'll touch on some small tweaks to it, but it's still going to be for businesses where they, there's a UK operation, 
where there's perhaps a global entity based overseas and those entities must be linked by usually by common ownership or control and where the overseas business wants to send somebody to the UK for a temporary period of, of time, it will be a temporary visa category and isn't in itself a route which leads to residence in the UK. So it's for temporary assignments. Um, we will now under the Global Business Mobility umbrella also have graduate trainee route. Again, that did exist under the old rules, but again, it's been rebranded. So um, that's for individuals who want to come to the UK as part of a sort of structured graduate training programme. There again must be that link between the overseas entity and the UK one. There needs to be a sponsor license in place, both for uh, the senior or specialist worker category and for graduate trainee. There are lower salary thresholds for the graduate trainee route, and it is designed for a short term sort of placement in the UK. So this new graduate trainee part of global business mobility will replace the ICT graduate trainee route. Um, there is a new category under uh, the Global Business Mobility route called UK Expansion Worker um, that replaces what some of you might have heard from uh, in the past, the sort of sole representative of an overseas business category. Um, it's quite a specialist category and many employers might not come across it, but it's for businesses that want to send someone to the UK to set up a branch or a subsidiary for the first time. So there needs to be an overseas presence, uh, overseas headquartered business, and then someone being sent to the UK to, to start up a business effectively. That now will become a or it has become a sponsored route. There needs to be a sponsor license put in place before businesses can use this. Uh, some of the criteria or rules around it have also changed a bit. And it is just for senior managers and specialist workers. It is also a temporary category, which is a bit different than the previous rules, which used to allow settlement after a period of time. So I would say that route uh, or, or subcategory has changed a bit more than some of the others. Um, but do, do take advice if you want to uh, know more about that route. The fourth uh, subcategory under Global Business Mobility route is the service supplier route. And this is for contractual service suppliers where there's somebody employed by an overseas business wants to send somebody again to the UK on a temporary basis to provide services covered by one of the UK's international trade commitments. Um, those trade agreements are, I think there's around about 15 on the list at the moment, and that list is likely to grow. So these are, uh, I guess, designed especially to meet those commitments under those trade agreements. Um, not every employer is going to, to need to use those, but it may be of interest to some businesses. Um, and finally, the secondment worker part is the fifth subcategory of global business mobility route. It's um, was designed to fill a sort of perceived gap in the immigration rules. And this is a brand new one and a new addition, I guess, to what we already had. Um, but it's only for high value contracts or investments um, by an overseas business into the UK. And the contract or the value of the investment worth um, must be worth at least 50 million and at least 10 million per year. Um, and the business has to sort of register that contract with the Home Office in order to be eligible to utilise that route. So brand new one there, but only for those high value contracts and investments. But it's worth just knowing what those sort of five subcategories are, albeit that I do think the ones uh, most to be most commonly used by employers will be the senior or specialist worker category. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, all of the global business mobility routes have now turned into sort of sponsored routes. So the sponsor license process has opened up to all of these uh, subcategories. I guess ICT was already sponsored, as was the graduate trainee route, but some of the others weren't before and now are. They are all um, temporary uh, immigration categories and designed for highly skilled jobs, not those kind of medium skilled jobs, which can be sponsored under certain routes. They are all subject to minimum uh, salary requirements. And for the intra-company transfer route I mentioned, it's largely the same as it was before. There's been a small tweak to the minimum salary requirements under that, which are now 42,400 instead of the previous sort of 41,000. And I've put up onto the slide there, the sort of minimum salary requirement for the graduate trainee part, which is lower. 
Um, but other than that, there still is a requirement uh, for the senior or specialist worker category to be in a highly skilled job. So that's that's a smaller list of jobs than are responsible under the skilled worker route. Knowledge of English language isn't required under uh, these subcategories because they are temporary. And that can be a reason for employers to use those routes. Um, often nowadays people use the skilled worker route because it's a uh, uh, a lot of the benefits of using ICT sort of fell away when the resident labour market test was abolished. But in cases where you do want to bring someone to the UK who isn't able to meet the standards under an English language test, then that senior or specialist worker part of GBM is a, a route that's worth bearing in mind. That's a major advantage of it. And people can move out of these routes into a route that does lead to settlement. It's just that the period that they spend in this route doesn't count towards a sort of five year settlement route. Um, so if we just move on to the next slide, some key takeaways then on this global business mobility route. So for most employers, uh, the replacement to ICT with the senior specialist worker category is the bit that's most relevant. That will automatically sort of move over on their sponsor license to include the, the new sort of branding or the new route. The other aspects of it might be less relevant for many employers. Some do use the graduate trainee route, but the others are fairly specialist categories. Um, the key takeaway in terms of the rules on uh, the senior or specialist worker category is that most of the rules aren't changing. It is still highly skilled jobs, but that minimum salary requirement has been tweaked slightly, but it remains a temporary category and doesn't count towards residence, so mainly suitable for temporary assignments to the UK. Uh, the main reason people may use it is where they can't satisfy that English language requirement, but there is going to be an added benefit of this category um, over the course of the next year, so no later than the 1st of January 2023 for European uh, senior or specialist workers, they're going to, there's going to be an uh, exemption introduced in terms of the immigration skills charge so there should be a lower cost attached to uh, the senior or specialist worker category route which might lead more employers to use it instead of the skilled worker route so that's a benefit that's not currently there but is coming in over the next year and then finally just to say uh, all of the visa fees were reviewed as of the 6th of April this year so there's been a slight increase to the visa application fee which is £625 for a three-year visa for the senior or specialist worker category and up-to-date details of all of the fees are available online um, on the website. Now just going to touch on the high potential individual visa um, this one is coming in on the 30th of May, so it's not yet in force, but we're just getting ready for it. And it's for individuals who've graduated from a qualifying top non-UK university within the last five years before the date of the application. It's almost the mirror image of a, the graduate route visa, which is for people studying at UK universities. So these are for non-UK universities, but the fact that they can apply within five years of having done that degree should open up this visa category to a a sort of broader range of individuals. Um, this route won't require sponsorship because the individuals are desirable and highly skilled and all the rest of it, but employers in the UK may well see people apply for jobs who've gone out and got this high potential individual visa or who may be eligible for it but haven't yet obtained it. In order for the person to qualify the university qualification that they're looking for, so it must appear on two of the global universities lists and UKVI will publish uh, those lists on the website. I've listed there uh, the sort of three uh, sort of sources uh, that they're going to be looking at, including, for example, the Times Education World University Rankings. Um, and the academ academic ranking of the world university. So if it appears in two of the three that are listed on that slide um, and the person's undertaken the degree in the last five years, that will meet the requirements. Similar to the graduate visa, it's a two-year visa in most cases, three years if they've undertaken a PhD. They can come to the UK to look for work. They don't need a job offer to start with. Uh, they can take up employment or self-employment. And in that sense, it's a flexible visa. They also don't have to do just highly skilled or medium skilled jobs. They can do any job for any employer. Um, a lot of those individuals will, however, um, 
want to be sponsored before their visa expires. So it's worth thinking about uh, the expiry date of the visa and whether if you do plan to retain the person, what that pathway is in the future in terms of their immigration status and whether you're going to be happy to sponsor them. Um, so, and the individual will need to find themselves in a suitable skilled job that meets the requirements if they want to be sponsored towards the end. So in terms of what this route means for many employers, it's a new source of skilled international talent. They don't need sponsored during the duration of their visa. There are no visa fees for the employer to pay and that the individual can go off, pay their visa application fee, get the visa themselves and then just present for work and the employer just has to do the right to work check. So in that sense, there's no kind of cost uh, sort of disincentives there. And from an employer's perspective, I guess, making sure you're including these people in your recruitment processes, uh, they should be on a level playing field with others. They don't require sponsorship and it's worth just bearing that in mind. And in terms of the cost of the visa, the cost is £715 plus the immigration health surcharge towards the cost of the M NHS. Um, employers are not obliged to pick up the cost of that, but some may choose to do so. If we just move on to then to the final of the three visa categories that I was going to touch on, the scale up visa. Um, so this one is coming later uh, in the summer. So 22nd of August is the date when this route will open. It's uh, a sponsored route. And in order to get a sponsor license under this route, the business will need to demonstrate that they are a suitable scale up business. That means that they will have to demonstrate a minimum number of staff plus certain levels of growth in order to get that sponsor license. And the individual will need to have a job offer in order to get a scale up visa. It will have to be at graduate, graduate level or above. So it's for those highly skilled roles and the minimum salary requirement for the job will be 33,000 per year with a minimum early rate applicable or the going rate for that particular job code. And there will be English language requirements and financial or maintenance requirements that go along with that. So the individual be, will be sponsored for the first six months, but the interesting bit about this visa is that after that initial six month period, the person can go on to work in other jobs for other employers without having to be sponsored. And this is why this route is of interest, not just to scale up businesses, but to any employers looking to recruit a uh, talent. If somebody comes to you with a scale up visa that they've already obtained, they should be able to work for you. Um, even if you don't have a scale up license and you're not a scale up business. So again, reviewing your recruitment procedures to make sure these individuals aren't being excluded from jobs unfairly is going to be important. Those individuals in order to be able to extend their visas and stay in the UK on a long term basis are going to have to show a certain level of earnings. So they're going to want to be economically active. But yeah, the main takeaway is even if you're not a scale up business, you might see people with these visas applying for jobs. And it doesn't mean you need to be a scale up in order to hire them. So I think we are just about out of time, but Erin, uh, uh, I think we've got a couple of questions coming through, so we'll possibly just run over just to take those. You're welcome to uh, to log off if you if you want to or to stay on for the session. And there is going to be a feedback uh, survey that will pop up just as the session ends. If we just maybe take one or two quickly then. Sure. So someone's asked, um, are retrospective checks required for those who have previously accepted a biometric residence permit for for right to work checks um, in the past? So the answer to that is no. If you did the right right to work checks that were in place at the time when the person started work, you don't need to go back and redo them. Um, so just because the rules have changed doesn't mean mean you need to go and do retrospective checks. But for new people starting jobs now, then the new rules will be in place and you need to meet these new, more onerous requirements. OK, and another one we've had is we've never paid um, the graduate route costs. Do you think employers may be more likely to pay costs of a high potential individual visa? Um, so there's certainly no obligation to. Um, and I would I would say lots of uh, individuals who qualify for that visa might just go off, pay for the visa, obtain it themselves and then sort of apply for a job. Um, but there's nothing to stop an employer picking up the tab for that. I guess um, if there's an individual that you really want to incentivize and attract, it may be that you offer to pay the fee um, as a way to get them on board. Um, but there is no obligation to do that. 
Right, thanks everyone for joining. Um, we will finish up there just because we're slightly over for time, but as I said, the feedback box should pop up now and thank you everyone to jo uh, for joining today.